Good morning, everyone. If you're out in the foyer, if you could make your way into the sanctuary, it's time to begin our service today. It is January 31st, in case you get mixed up on what day it is. <laughs> Ever since the pandemic and the shutdowns, the lockdowns, it's been difficult to figure out, to remember what day it is. But it's Sunday, January 31st. And so we're glad to have you here in the house of God. We're glad to have our visitors here today. You're welcome. It's good to see you. And if you'll stand with me as people are making their way in from the foyer, we want to greet you that are watching us online. We never forget about you that are still sheltering at home. We just want to, you to know that we miss you, but we know that you're there. And we just continue to pray God's grace over you. We want you to enter into the service this morning. Follow along. <laughs> Follow along. Uh, that was my little grandson waving at me from the sound booth. <laughs> uh, I see you back there, buddy. Uh, sorry about that. You know, family is family is first. What can I say? <laughs> Can't ignore that. Uh, but what was I saying? Oh, you people at home. Yeah, we want you to participate in the service. When we pray, we want you to pray. When we sing and worship, we want you to do that right there in your home. We know that God is Emmanuel, God with us. And it doesn't matter where we're physically located. He is with us. And he will bless you right there in your home in the same way that he is blessing and pouring out his spirit here in the sanctuary. So we encourage you that are watching to enter into this time with us. So would you just bow your heads? We just want to pray and ask God by his Holy Spirit to be in this place this morning. He knows he's welcome. <laughs> He knows that this whole building is dedicated to him. He knows that we have dedicated our lives to him, and he knows he's welcome. But sometimes, you know what? He just still likes to hear it from you, his children. <laughs> You're welcome here, Lord. I want you to come. Why don't you just in your own way reach out to him in this moment and tell him, You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. You're welcome here. I'm ready for you. I'm ready for you. I'm ready for you. I'm ready for you to come. I'm ready for you to work in my life. I'm ready for you to open my spiritual ears. I'm ready for you to open my spiritual eyes. I'm ready for you to do whatever work is needed in me. I'm ready for you to awaken me. I'm ready for you to revive me. I know you're bringing awakening to the world. I know you're bringing revival to the world, but start with me, Lord. <laughs> Start with me. Awaken me and revive my spirit today, God. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready to take that next step. I'm ready to go farther and to reach higher. Increase my faith today, Lord. Increase our faith today, Lord. Holy Spirit, we love you. We're so mindful of you. We know that nothing that we do is without you. We just invite you to come, Holy Spirit, into this place this morning, into this physical place, into the homes where people are watching, into our spirits. Just come. Come and have your way. Come and bring your intentions. Hallelujah. Let everything that we do, let everything that we say magnify and glorify and lift up our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to enter into worship here in the sanctuary. We want you to worship with us at home. We have a free uh, style of worship. Um, if it's your first time here, we have a freestyle of worship, which means that we just uh, allow people to come into the altars, to step out into the aisles, to uh, come to the altar area, whatever they want to do to worship. You're welcome to do that. Would you worship with us this morning? hard 
Just wait in his presence for a moment. Just sing in the spirit between you and your father. is not a thing peace is a person he's called the prince of peace come thou lord jesus there's somebody receiving peace right now this kind of like i see just kind of like jesus walking up to you and just stepping right into you he said in the Gospel of John, I and my Father come and make our abode with you. Peace is not something that just kind of comes over a home Peace is the person of Jesus in the home. Mm. Go ahead and just let some healing take place. Let the Prince of Peace just bring that healing peace. Aramanda se. Aramanona kasaranda basto. Peace that the world does not give. Peace that the world does not understand. Sovrama. Peace that passes everyday logic. 
There's some people here and there's some people watching by internet and, and, and your mind has just been anything but peaceful. It's been troubled. Why don't you just by faith, as a faith act, put your hand on your head and just receive Jesus, receive the peace of Jesus. Oh, Ramadan, receive rest, receive peace. Oh, Paranda, Serekese, Paranda, Bokusto. While you've got your hand up there, there's, there's been somebody that's been like having one headache after another. Maybe it just kind of lets up a little bit and then, boy, it kicks in again. There's some that are having headaches because of stress, worry, concern. There are others that are having headaches because of other uh, neurological problems or even physiological problems. The Lord is healing headaches and they're very coarse and they're very, mm, at their very basis. In Jesus' name, receive. O Ramanento se te sabarum te aso. Ita Ramana nansa ta seca tansa. The Lord is doing something in heads right now. If you need anything done in your head, just receive it. I believe I should share a memory with you, a remembrance. In the original language, the root word of remembrance means to reproduce. So we're going to remember what the Lord has done and just expect Him, look for Him to reproduce it. At the beginning of December, man that we have known for many, many years of family, been close to them, called and I knew it was him. I could see it on my cell phone, but all I could hear on the other end of the line was weeping. I knew something wasn't right. I know the man. I've never known him to weep. I just sat there on the phone quietly praying in the spirit finally when he gathered himself he said my daughter and she is my daughter's age Melissa's age he said my daughter has just been given four months to live we've been praying for her for I don't know five four five six years I don't remember it's been a long time she's a severe diabetic they haven't been able to do anything for her. They haven't been able to help her. It's just been like gradually getting worse and worse. And now she was down to like skin and bone. When we got to her, she was 87 pounds. He said, the doctor said, something is really not right. I've got to do a brain MRI. They did an MRI on the brain and found a tumor the size of a pecan right in the center of that area of her brain that tells the blood sugars what to do. He said, here's our problem. He said, but from what I'm seeing here, I would estimate she's got about four months to live. We went to that area of Central Texas where they live and uh, went to her home she was in a wheelchair. She looked like she was some decrepit, aged old woman sitting there in that wheelchair, skin and bones. And on the way there, Kathy and I had prayed for the Lord to give us a word for her, to lay hands on her, to see her healed. And we laid hands on her, sitting there in that wheelchair, and we began to prophesy to her, declare the healing of the Lord over her. Two days later, 
phone signaled that I had a text. I opened it up. Her mother was sitting on one side of the living room and she was standing on the other side of the living room. And I heard her mother say, okay, now, that young woman walked across that living room in full stride and full strength. She walked up to the camera. She got down in the camera and she said, Marty, Jesus has healed me. Hallelujah! A few days after that, she's back at the hospital. The doctor said, you need to come in here after that last x-ray. He said, he said you know, I, I know I gave you a prognosis, but he said, you know, we need to see if we can do something. Let's do another MRI. They did another MRI. She's sitting in her waiting room there in the doctor's office with her parents. The doctor came to the door and said, come with me. Very serious. They walked into his office. And on his office desk was this big monitor, computer monitor. And he said, here's two x-rays on this computer monitor, and I want you to come over here and look at these, and I want you to explain something to me. He said, here's the x-ray we took last week. See that tumor the size of a pecan? I told you you had four months to live. They said, yeah. He said, look at this, look at this x-ray and explain something to me. I want to know where that tumor went. Hallelujah! Yeah, Jesus is the one. We give thanks and praise to Jesus. He said, whatever you've been doing, I want you to keep doing it. Well, she'd been declaring that Jesus had healed her. And when they finalized whatever it is they had to finalize in his office there, and he was getting ready to dismiss them, he looked at her. He said, young lady, if I were you, I wouldn't walk out of this hospital. He said, I'd run. They let her run out of that hospital all the way to the parking lot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you got anything going on in your head, even if it's just an occasional headache, why should you have an occasional headache, let alone regular migraine headaches? Are, are headaches brought on by a tumor? Are headaches brought on by some kind of stress or some other physiological or psychological problem? Or, or I declare in Jesus' name, we are agreeing with that remembrance that you are the one who takes stuff out of us that doesn't belong there. another meeting in, in another part of Central Texas one morning I had a word of knowledge that there was something in the brain I've never had a word of knowledge like that before never said anything like that before but it was like I could see something about the size of a pea and it, it, right in the middle of somebody's brain and the word of knowledge was that the Lord was removing that out of the brain the Lord was doing something inside of a brain and there was a lady out in the middle of the congregation that kind of like, <gasps> like it took her breath or something, you know. And, and she just, oh, she was just worshiping. Everybody was just worshiping. People had their hands on their head. She walked up after service. She said, Marty, I have been having problems. I could not put two thoughts together. I couldn't keep two thoughts in line. Here, here's a thought, and I'm headed a certain way, and then all of a sudden, out of left field comes another thought. And she said, I couldn't prevent it. I couldn't communicate. I couldn't receive information. But she said, when you said that the Lord was doing something in the brain, she said, so help me. Literally, inside my cranial cavity, where my brain is, I felt something move. I don't know about you, but I've never felt anything move inside my brainal cavity unless I ran into a brick wall, you know. But she said, I felt something move in there. I said, that's called the great physician doing surgery. 
Thank you, Jesus. And she said, from that very moment that I felt that move in my brain, all of my thoughts have been just like they need to be. Thank you, Jesus. If you're having a problem keeping your thoughts together, where it's, whether it's a pea size something or other, or if it's, a, it's stress, or it's nervousness, or it's, it's nerve problems, or whatever it is, I declare to you, your thoughts are coming clear. Whatever is going on in your head is healed. Even sinus cavities are being healed. Ear canal problems are being healed. Somebody's got a lump on your head. You're getting healed. That lump is going in Jesus' name. Is there anyone that has a, a, any kind of a problem in your head that, that they, these words of knowledge and remembrances have been related to? Is there anyone that has a, you need some kind of a healing? Steve, just step out in that aisle there. Anyone else, just step out in the aisle. Marty, I've got something going on in my head, or I've got a lump, or a growth, or a tumor, or a polyp, or whatever else it might be. You might have polyps in your sinuses. I don't know. But just step out in the aisle so we'll know who you are. Okay, there's one here. There's one here. That Back there, you, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, over here. Now I'm just going to ask every, oh, uh, Bishop, you too, okay. I'm just going to ask everyone to stand. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you believe that by his stripes we are healed, I want you to walk over and just put a, don't talk to them or anything if you would, but just put an, uh, a hand on their shoulder or on their back or Now, a word of knowledge is not a prayer request. You've heard me say that before. A word of knowledge is an announcement of what God Almighty is doing by His power, by the working of his, the presence of His Spirit, by the working of His resurrected Son. So what we're going to do is we're just going to agree that this work is done in Steve, that this work is done in Bishop, that this work is done in Sister Way and this, these other brothers and sisters. Right now, here in this room, in this building, we know that the Jesus who healed blindness in the Gospels, we know the Jesus who raised the dead, we know the Jesus who cast out demons and, and spirits and powers, He is the same Jesus that is present in this room today. The great physician is here, and by His stripes we are healed. Declare healing over that person. I declare, I, Steve, I declare you're healed in Jesus' name. I declare that healing that's in the Bible, that's in Jesus, I declare it over you. This young lady too? All righty. In Jesus' name. No complications, no problems, no lingering. A whole new... Uh, working of brain and brain cells and nerves and a whole new working of thoughts the mind of Christ that's an awesome mind that's creative it's healing it's redemptive and boy does our culture and our society need all of that coming through you in Jesus name healing Healing in those minds, healing inside those skulls, inside those sinuses, inside the brain, inside nerve centers. Nerves work correctly. Nerve signals flow smoothly, correctly. In Jesus' name. Everything from heritage that is negative and that is not of healing, that is not of the purposes and the will of God, I break in Jesus' name. Mm. 
You're starting a whole new family bloodline history right here in your generation. thank Jesus for just a moment. Just thank him for what he's done. Hallelujah. We just received a uh, testimony from our live stream from your mother, Rashida. I'm not there, but I had an injury to the left side of my temple, and every now and then my thoughts would not come together. I had been praying, and Jesus has sent the healing today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Lord! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. We had a healing in our pre-service prayer this morning. <laughs> Brother Dave, Lenita had a word about backs coming into alignment. And Brother Dave, uh, why don't you share that with us, uh, Bob or Roy, whoever's got the microphone there. Just give it to Dave and uh, let him share that so we can rejoice with him. I have uh, I had a, for three days a, a lower back slipped on me at work and burning and pinching and carrying on, you know. And I've tried everything, rolling, sleeping different ways. Sister Nickin came in praying and she said, God is fixing someone's back. Yes, hallelujah. And it's in about two minutes, I turned to look at her and something popped in my back. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I ain't felt this good since I was 14 years old. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. He's still the healer. <laughs> He's still the healer. He's still the healer. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Hallelujah. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 You're so good, Jesus. You're so good, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This time we normally just pray over our nation. If you just continue to pray that, Linda will come to the altar. Bet worship team, if you'll just continue to pray that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just want to shift our focus for just a moment. Jesus is the healer. He is the healer of our nation. He will be the healer of our nation. He will be the healer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just speak to you, America, this morning to come to the altar. We call you, America, come to the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar of awakening. Come to the altar of repentance. Come to the altar of humility. Come to the altar this morning. We call you. We call you. We call you. We call you in one by one. We call in our family members. Come to the altar. We call in our neighbors. Come to the altar. We call in Washington County. Come 
to the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar, state of Texas. We're calling you. Come to the altar. Come to the altar, America. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. There's freedom. There's healing. There's provision. There's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. You have not sinned away your day of grace. You have not gone so far that repentance is not yours. Come. We call you today. We call you today. Come for healing. Come for forgiveness. Come. Come, America. Come and be saved. Come and be healed. Come and be healed. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the Holy Spirit sweep from ocean to ocean, from north to south, sweep across our land. You're the only answer. You are the only answer. You are the only answer. Come, Holy Spirit, sweep our nation with the convicting power of your presence. Everything that has been turned upside down, write it again. Bring it right again, God. We release our nation to you. We release those that are in governing positions we release them to you so we say work work your work holy spirit work in our homes work in our neighborhoods work in our state capital work in austin texas work work in the governor's office work through our legislators work jesus do your work Work in the governor's mansions all across this country, Lord. Stir the hearts of governors, Father. Shake their hearts, Father. I know you've been stirring. How about a little shaking, God? Hallelujah. Father, work in our nation's capital. We just send your spirit to work there, Lord. God, we've seen strengthening over the churches in Washington, D.C. We know there are some standing for truth there, Lord. And God, we just send your spirit to strengthen them today. God, that they will just uh, work, that you'll work in the atmosphere, Lord, of our nation's capital today. That you'll work in the halls of Congress, Lord. That you'll work in the White House, God. That you'll bring redemption. That you'll bring healing. God, you'll bring forgiveness, Lord humble ourselves before you, God. We know that you are our only hope, God. You're our only hope. And we release hope today. We release hope today. We're in agreement today, Lord, that it's righteousness that exalts a nation, God. We want to bring our nation into alignment with you, Father, by your Holy Spirit, not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit, God. Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah 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 we thank you father for awakening that we're beginning to see already we thank you Lord for prodigals that we're already seeing return to the house of God we celebrate that Lord it's already happening father we celebrate the awakening in hearts Lord of the disconnected we celebrate that Lord we know that you're calling and you're drawing people back. And we thank you for that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a continuing part of our worship. We want to bring our offerings this morning. If you give online, now would be the time to do that in your home. Just go to our website. There's a drop down there for giving. If you brought an offering this morning, you can go ahead and bring it. We do want you to know that at the end of this service, we are, after Sister Kathy ministers, we are going to take up an offering for Marty and Kathy this morning. And so we want you to be prepared for that. You can do that online as well in the guest speaker, where it says guest speaker online. 
Father, thank you. Thank you for what you have given us. We thank you for the provision that you've given this house. We thank you for the provision that you've given every family, Lord. We thank you for jobs. We thank you for strength to work. We thank you for incomes. We thank you for promotions. We thank you for open doors to new careers, Lord, for stepping up, Father, into new positions. God, we just thank you for what you have given us, Lord. We thank you for your multiplying hand upon it. We thank you that all of our needs are met in Christ Jesus. Every need of every family, we declare, is met in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and just get, uh, give you some announcements on the screen, and then I'll be right back with you. Amen, amen, amen. All right, we're going to dismiss our children and let them go back to Children's Church. Just want to remind you to pick up a bulletin so you can have a, a written uh, record of everything that we're doing. You can check our website. Our calendar on there is always up to date. want to remind you about next Sunday is Team Sunday. So remember, we're going to team up with missionaries. Craig and Joy Womack will be our guest in our service next week, and we're going to be blessed to hear about their work in the Canary Islands. But Team Sunday is when you can wear any kind of sports team or Team Jesus t-shirt or whatever you want to wear. Uh, if you got a jersey or a t-shirt for any team, you wear that next Sunday, okay? You have special permission to wear your t-shirts, your jeans. It's a casual day. It's just a way for us to recognize team building, and it's a fun thing to do. So next week, Team Sunday, teaming up with missionaries Craig and Joy Womack. Also, after the service tonight, our young adults are going to meet for a fellowship, so don't forget that. You can get with Pastor Anna if you have any questions about that. We are having an evening service today. Amen. If you're watching us by live stream, the service will be live streamed tonight too. So you that are sheltering at home, you're not going to miss it. It will be at six o'clock tonight. Okay. Six o'clock tonight. We have a service. Uh, we do have nursery for zero to five, but the rest of the children will be in here with us. So we'll be excited tonight to hear from brother Marty. He's going to be giving us uh, some declarations that we can pray and declare over our year this year, 2021. So we're anxious to hear that. Amen. Well, it's such a pleasure to have Marty and Kathy in the service with us this morning. I don't, you, you know them. They've been with us many times. They've ministered to this house. We've uh, been um, blessed to walk with them for many years. I first knew Marty when I was in high school just last week. <laughs> uh, we met when I was in high school when he was the district youth director for our um, uh, for our district, and uh, we met back there, and then it, God just blessed us to uh, have our paths cross again about 
eight years or so ago, and I'm just so blessed by their um, influence and their speaking into our lives, and we've just been so blessed to be in relationship with them, and this house has been so blessed to be in relationship with Marty and Kathy. So would you get on your feet and welcome them into the service this morning? Come on up here. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Good morning. Um, am I ready to go? Okay. Good morning, good morning. And it's good to be with you. Blessings to you. Blessings on you. Blessings on your house. And we, you know, we can't forget, I hope we don't, that blessing's a powerful force. Yes. It's more powerful than curse, y'all. The blessing of the Lord takes more force into the atmosphere than a curse could ever produce. And thank you, God, for that. Uh, I don't want to talk a long time, hopefully. <laughs> I don't plan to. But what I want to bring to your attention this morning, to our attention, is a timely telegram from Jesus. And it was a telegram he gave us in the 14th chapter of John. And he said something very simple but very, very profound. And he didn't present it like it was a good suggestion or maybe a good idea. It was a directive. And very few words, he just said it. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. Amen. And, you know, that little, of course, we know what troubled is. Don't let your heart be agita agi agitated, disturbed, fearful, intimidated, cowardly, all those unsettled. Don't let your heart be there. And, you know, you, you look at our nation today and you think, can you think we wouldn't be troubled in our hearts? Can you look at our economy that changes every 24 hours and say, you really telling me not to be disturbed, not to be troubled? Or there's some of you facing situations that just seem absolutely changeless. And the thought of being not troubled about it, it's like, wait a minute. And I've asked the Lord that before. Well, what do I do with this? Because this is right in my face. I can't get it out of my face. What do I do? And, you know, but he, the thing that we need to take hope in is this. If Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled, that tells you that it's possible to live without your heart staying troubled. That's, that's just in the, he doesn't tell you to do something that can't be done. And it can be done. So let's break it down a little bit. And first, let me start here. There's two different words. You know how the New Testament's translated from Greek. In Greek, they have two different words that English, we would say troubled for both of them. They both translate as the word troubled. But they actually kind of show you two different degrees of trouble, two different levels of trouble. And I'll put it to you in this sense. In, in first, or 2 Corinthians 4.8, it says... We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. If you listen there, what you hear is there's stuff coming at us, but it's not getting to us. And that's one kind of trouble that the kind of trouble everybody in their whole life experiences is when stuff comes at you. And the word there in Greek is phlebo. And it carries the meaning of being swarmed. Just stuff keeps coming and crowding around you. And you're bombarded. And I'm sure there's not a person in here because we're all over five years old. They all went to their church. Everybody in here, you've had trouble come at you. And we talk about the perfect storm. Those are real. It just comes. I mean, when it comes, it comes from every direction. And the thing is, we, we walk it out, we overcome it, we outlive it, and we move on. That's one kind of trouble. It's outside of us. But then there's the kind of trouble that goes in on us when we do get distressed and get in despair. And like, well, you think about measles, they're trouble. They itch, they're painful. But when they go in on you, you're in trouble. They're more dangerous if measles settle on one of the organs in your body. Instead, you know, they go to your heart. They can cause all kinds of things like, you know, scarlet fever and everything else. Uh, measles can go to the eyes and blind a person. 
Now that's a different kind of troubled when it's troubling your, your quality of life and your future. That's when that trouble that's come at you has gotten into your heart. That's the word for troubled right there. And it's terrasso. That's the word Jesus was using when he said, don't let your heart get to this place to where the troubling has gone in on you. And it's stir eating at you. It's stirring in there. The commotion is within you. And he was saying, don't let your troubles go to your heart. Tend to them. Outlive them. Beat them. Make them work, but don't let them go in and become part of who you are to where you're, you stay agitated. You're restless in your core. You're perplexed. You're anxious. You're fearful. You're distressed. And you're, the question is, can we all let stuff go in? Absolutely. I would, I would guess there's not a person in here who hasn't at some time gotten in that condition of where your heart is so troubled, your whole life looks like this big gray uh, rainy day. Because it has gone in on it. But the reason Jesus was saying this, I, basically he was saying don't stay there. Don't lay down in that. Don't sit down, tolerate it, and act like that's okay. It's, this is just life. I have to think this way. Because if it settles on you, it's going to cause stress. And let's be practical. Science tells us that the basis for 99% of physical disease is stress. So we could say, if you're doing it like the geometry, if A plus B is C, then B plus A is C. Anyway, you add this up, uh, trouble on the inside, uh, stress can be a door to disease, so troubled hearts can be a door to disease. And that's, that's it's like we, we've got to realize this is a very powerful force to just let it run rampant within our heart. There's no wisdom in that. You actually make yourself, you get worn out. That's what disease means. Did you know that in its root word? It means to rub raw and uh, wear out. And you get to that position, you get weak, you get sick. And that's what disease is about. There's the nature of it. But there's, it's more than that too. It may not just be physical. I've seen people with a troubled heart and it destroyed their, their soul. Uh, it destroyed their mood, their attitude, their views of life. If you look at life through a troubled heart, it's going to be a different color than reality, and it's going to be a different color than pretty yes. because it's coming from a troubled basis, first of all. It'll toxify the atmosphere around you. It's not fun to be around somebody with a troubled heart. No. Ah. I mean, what am I supposed to do, spit or go blind? It's like, what, what, I can't fix that for you, but could you get it fixed so we can go on from here? Uh, a troubled heart will sabotage your relationships. Amen. I mean, people who are normally, you know, what you said wasn't a big deal, but today, because they have a troubled heart, they'll bite your head off. Well, you know, there was no need to even get your teeth out. It wasn't that important. But their heart is troubled, and that's where it springs from. You can't live like that without getting bitter and irritable and angry. And that's going to affect your whole life from that point on if you stay there. So we're not talking here today about something that's optional. This isn't like picking electric windows or leather seats for a new car, y'all. That's an option. No, we're talking about something that's essential wisdom. Like, you need a motor in that new car. Whatever else you get, you need a motor. It's that essential that we hear what Jesus was emphasizing when he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Yeah. And you know, in the Bible, you've read in the King James Version, where it'll say, verily, verily. When the Bible puts something twice, there is a special emphasis on it. And Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled two times in this one chapter. And he said it right there in verse 1. And then he says it later in verse 27. So we're not talking an option. If you want a God outcome on your life, if you want the blessing of God on your life, you cannot live with a troubled heart. You've got to overcome a troubled heart. I look at it this way. It's like when you're driving and you see a flashing red light. You know that means stop, get your bearings, what's going on at that intersection, and make some choices about how to proceed then, when and how and what direction. It's the same way. If we've got a troubled heart, it should be like a flashing red light to us. That, And a lot of times we can be in deep, troubled state before we even realize it. 
because life has a whole lot of stuff that piles up. But the moment you realize, wait, that should be a flashing light. I need to stop, figure out what's going on and see, make some choices to move on from here. So at the point, and this is very simplistic, but let me say this. It probably goes without saying. If you realize your heart, if troubling has gone in on you, it's not just having to deal with circumstances and crazy people and, and devils out here. It's like something in here is bothering you on a deeper level. Something in here is affecting your decisions. When you realize that, one thing you need to do right up front, and like I said, it's simple. You need to make the choice to not let your imagination get in the driver's seat. There's nothing worse, or you don't need to let anybody else's imagination get in your driver's seat either. Uh, that, that can be a catastrophe on the way. I can remember growing up, because see, imagination comes up with, well, what if? What if this ends up doing this? What if You can borrow trouble. When I was growing up in my neighborhood, if anybody in my neighborhood, y'all, stepped on a rusty nail, my mother would take me to get a tetanus shot. I kid you not. I, finally, the doctor said, she can't have another one, Miss Buchanan. I said, well, thank you. You know, I thought I had enough for life already. And she, but my mom had an imagination about everything. She had a very vivid imagination. And she could imagine what lockjaw would do to me. And, and in, in fact, y'all, she was so vivid in her description of it, her imagination troubled my heart, too. There was always a place in me that feared rust of any kind. Uh, you know, it was hard for me to even open a can. I thought, mm, you know, this may be rusty and I don't know it. But that her imagination would get in the driver's seat. And you can't leave your imagination behind. You're going to have it all your life. And it can be a positive thing at some points. But here's the key. Make it sit in the back seat. You don't let it get in the driver's seat. Because it will add to trouble, believe me. Uh, trying to just cover all the bases, it will add to trouble. A second choice you need to make once you realize, wait, something, you may be well aware of it, but if you're just realizing, wait, I'm sensing a flashing red light here, one thing you need to decide right then is don't mouth about what you begin to pick up on. And what I'm saying there is, you know, Matthew 12 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what's going on in here, what you're thinking, subconsciously or even consciously, is going to bubble out your mouth in your conversation at some point if it stays there. If it stays there, you'll hear it. And what's dangerous about that is it's not going to be pretty. That's going to be like bad breath coming out and filling the room. Because the negative thoughts, the fears, the what-ifs, the uh, aggravation, the frustration, the irritation, the anger over it, that's what's going to come out in your conversation. And uh, I have a, a, a message for you. We talked, someone this morning was talking about the power of the spoken word. It was in the song. And we, this is one way we're like God, y'all. We're created in His image. There's a creative force in our words. He created the world, speaking it into existence. There is a creative force in the atmosphere when we speak. That, that's a given. And if we're going to mouth, we are actually going to draw fire. And we're going to empower our enemy. And let me break that down for you. 1 Peter 5.8 most of you probably know this scripture. It says, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He doesn't have to be able to read your mind. He can't read your mind. If you've been worried about that, be relieved right now. He cannot read our mind. The problem is he doesn't have to. Because <laughs> what we're thinking is going to come out our mouth. And he will sniff that out and be at your front door in a heartbeat. He, here's the thing, by what comes out of your mouth, he knows when you're a lunchable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he takes advantage of it. In that sense, let's, let's go a little bit further in understanding this prowling adversary. He's like a lawyer. He knows, a crafty, cunning lawyer who knows what to take advantage of to beat you with his agenda. Now an adversary right there in that 1 Peter 5.8, the word adversary means opponent in a lawsuit. 
That tells you the nature of our adversary. He is building a case. And here's something I'll, I'll throw in. I won't go into this. But in Genesis, God gave man dominion in the earth. The only way the devil can have any success at all is when he has a human's agreement. Because we have the say. We are in dominion. God gave it to us. He never took it back. People say, well, God's sovereign. Yes, he is. And that sovereign God is the one who created the order we live in. And he hadn't changed his mind. We know it. The devil knows it. And he takes advantage of it if he can. So if he can get you, he, and hey, y'all, he knows the word. He knows Matthew 20, I mean 12, 34, whether we do or not, about this connection between the heart and the mouth. So if he can get you to mouthing, and I'm pretty sure he's got us marked as the ones most likely to mouth. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he has, uh, we got a track record of a really good friend of mine years ago. She said, Kathy, I know the devil can't read my mind. How come he can push my buttons like he does? I said, well, I can't read your mind either, but I know what you're thinking because you think that way all the time. <laughs> and so I know where your buttons are too. And I said, you've got to realize he will take advantage of you because he's your enemy. And so knowing he wants your words to use them as instruments, legal instruments for hell's agenda. Now, this, this gets really... It's simple in a way, but it's like, are you kidding me? Some people don't, don't understand this, but there's nothing in life that doesn't connect. We can live our whole lifetime and never know the connections and still walk in it all the time. But he understands connections because he's cunning enemy working against us, looking for the leverage point. So he knows if he can rattle you, he can get you to mouthing. So guess what? He goes to really nasty lengths to build the perfect storm around you. And you've wondered before, is, uh, I've asked the Lord this very question. Is the devil uh, just targeting me or are you trying to get me to grow up or something? And you know how he usually answers that? Yes. Because he will bring a good result out of it, but the devil will target you for his purposes. You're just a pawn to him. Uh, this, that's what I see going on in the, in the politics in our nation. These, these poor, del deluded people think the enemies of Eve, this darkness is going to be loyal to them. It'll never happen. They'll, the darkness will get you in the place where you're destroyed and they go on. And this, he is that of that nature. And, you know, I've, I've wondered, people have talked about this before. We've had, you know, sat and talk, and I've heard people ask, do you really believe the devil has the ability to build a storm? <laughs> my, my answer is evidently. <laughs> because God knows I didn't do it, and I know he didn't do it. Uh, who else did this? This one wasn't my in-laws either. <laughs> Uh, if they're watching, you know I'm kidding. <laughs> My in-laws are wonderful. I love them. Uh, <laughs> praise God. But he, he does have the ability to build a storm and pile up opposition against you. You know, I mean, look at Jesus. He harassed him constantly. With politics, with uh, jealousy, religious jealousy. He, he used things like uh, false accusation. Um, even he built literal storms. You know, when Jesus said, let's go to the other side, the storm would have kept them from it had Jesus not said, get out of the way. So, yeah, he will build a storm. And think about it. The word doesn't say no weapons will be formed against us. In Isaiah 54, it doesn't say... In fact, it says the opposite. When a weapon is formed against you, it will not have ultimate success. So they're going to be formed against you, and he's going to be behind it. You can bow your head and believe that. And the, the problem is, some people said, well, uh, you know, that scripture says that, but this weapon certainly prevailed against my family. Well, I'll tell you this again. Human agreement is involved in that. If you, get, if you get in alignment with the trouble he started, you start fearing it, live in, live in a, a terror of it, you're positioning your agreement with it instead of against it. I can remember walking through my house one time. I don't even remember what it was I was frustrated over. 
Um, th there's no way I could remember everything I've ever been frustrated over. Okay. <laughs> but what I said, I walked in the kitchen and said, Dad, gum it. And the Holy Spirit said, don't say that. And I, I stopped and I said, well, Lord, my mom even let me say that word. What, what, what do you mean? He said, you're agreeing with the flow of what's going on instead of stopping it. Your frustration is feeding the flow, Kathy. It's time to say something to stop it and bring this thing in a new, new direction. Again, the power of the spoken word. But when we consider the danger and the possible damage of just staying troubled, it becomes clear to us why Jesus emphasized don't let your heart stay in that troubled state. And here's something we have to realize, and here's, here's like sitting at that flashing light, another choice we have to make. We have to choose to do something about it. It's not likely to just go away, you know that? I've heard people say, well, don't think about it. Have you ever tried to tell yourself not to think about something? I mean, Scarlett O'Hara can do that, but that's fiction. Real life, you need to get it resolved. Because you say, don't think about it, and yourself says, don't think about what? What? And what, it, well, but what if I said, don't think about it? It's like a ping pong game to insanity. Yes. That's not the way to deal with trouble in your heart. You've got to come to a resolve of it. And you know, one thing I thought of when you hear the phrase in the King James, it says, let not your heart be troubled. There's something about, or don't let your heart be troubled. The word let, L E T, to us in English, is not a real strong, forceful word. It's kind of a laid-back word. If we really got the direct interpretation from the Greek for that, that where Jesus said this, you know what it would really say to us? He said, God forbid that you let your heart get stuck in a troubled state. And he, he, it was that impacting, that serious, that important, because a troubled heart can grow from a campfire to a raging forest fire if we don't overcome it. We've got to take action to resolve it or the tro that troubled heart will dictate your whole life. And there, there are people that they just reserve a part of their heart to stay troubled. Some, there's parts of our hearts that may have been troubled since we were 10 years old, 12 years old. And it's not like it's a constant in our face. That's why we don't realize it's there. But it will affect some decision down the road. It will be a negative force working against us somewhere down the road. Jesus said, don't let it stay there. Because if it becomes a filter, you see your life through it. And that's not true. Both times that Jesus told us in John 14 to not let our hearts be troubled, he gave us a key in both the verses in verse 1. And in verse 27, in verse 1, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. You trust in God. Trust me. Amen. The key there is trust is, is a powerful tool to resolve troubling. Yes. Sometimes it's the only thing that will pull the rug out from under troubling is where you trust in God. Yes. And, you know, there, I've can, there have been times in my life I've thought, okay, I am putting this at your feet because I'm tired of fooling with it. And in my mind, that was trusting God. It was the end of my rope. I'm going to trust God. But trust is more beautiful than that. Trust is more powerful than that. Because trust is I, you knowing who your God is. And when you know who he is, you get confident he's never going to change. That means he's going to be, have that love, that mercy, that, uh, that goodness toward you. And that will never waver. He's going to be wise. He's going to be constantly aware. He's going to be powerful. His attributes will never diminish. That's why we can trust him. Yes. And there are people who know that about God. But when you're confident and you're convinced those things about God, then you have come to a trust. Yes. Because you know that can't be shaken. And when you can't find answers to your questions... It boils down to, but I trust what your word said, and there it is. I have, in the last probably three years, finally, my young self, I have finally figured out that there is a place of simple trust that I just flat quit handling it like I always have and just 
trust God to be God because I know who he is. And there is an immediate resolve there that I don't know how to put in words, but trust is a key for us. And your confidence in your undiminishing God, nothing ever gets less, that's going to orchestrate a right outcome. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You know where it's hard sometimes for Christians to trust is where they, it's the situation. They know God had nothing to do with this. I did it all by myself. It was one of my stupid moments. And I can't expect him to bring an outcome. Yes, you can because he's still God. I mean, when we get away from uh, him being who he is based on our merit and who we are, that's trusting him. You know how you'll know when you're standing in trust? You rest. The struggle, the mental ping pong stops. And you know he's God. Therefore, the outcome, he's going to work this together for my good. And I can't fix it. I've tried. But troubling and worrying about it and fretting over it is not getting it there. I'm going to trust God. That is the best place to be. It's, it's better than an Alka-Seltzer for indigestion. It's that literal, though, because we are confident God will have the last word and he will orchestrate the outcome for our good. Bottom line, no arguing beyond that point. Then in that second mention or that second declaration of don't let your heart be troubled in verse 27, that gives us another awesome key because before he said don't let your heart be troubled, he said this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. He doesn't give us just a normal calm, calmness. No, his peace is a force released in our behalf. It's his supernatural peace. And when you've got a troubled heart, it's the same thing as inflammation or infection in your soul. His peace is the antibiotic salve for that. And it is that potent. It can take the inflammation and the threat away. So when your heart's troubled, we go to the Prince of Peace. We get that that dosage of his peace. We get that deposit. And it literally means, peace means supernaturally steadied. Like the trembling and the back and forth has to be still when it's in the peace of God. I felt his peace in this room this morning. When Marty was talking about that, I thought, I can't lift my arms. I thought, well, you didn't sleep a long time last night. I'm not sleepy. I mean, I'm sitting there and having an argument right there with myself. But I couldn't lift my arms. I thought, what? And finally, it was, I realized, hey, this is tangible. He is in this room with his peace. And hey, y'all, I I can tell you something that we'll figure out later. And I pray right now, God, let us figure it out. Let us see the connection later. There were things healed in this room this morning by the peace of God. Things that are in the soul and they're the root of a physical problem. The healing of that is also going to come back to a peace that he put in your soul this morning. So be it. it. It happened. His peace... Here's what it defined. If you define it in the New Testament, peace means safety, security, and exemption from emotional chaos. His peace doesn't make you exempt from trouble, but his peace keeps you from emotional storms during the trouble. That's how powerful his peace is. And when we have the peace of God concerning anything, that's a treasure. I mean, put a bow on that. That is a treasure. And when we need to get, when we have this peace, I'm going to tell you right now, bear this in mind, when the peace of God comes, just like he did this morning, you get a double-fisted grip on it because it will be challenged. And I'll tell you why. Do you know one of the main things that stands up against peace when, when God's peace is given to you in a deposit? You know what will come against it the most? is your own experience. Your experience will argue with peace. Oh, but you remember what happened to so-and-so when when she hurt, uh, yeah, or or yourself. You remember, oh yeah, you thought God was going to do something three years ago, but but, your experience is the loudest and most obnoxious voice in your head sometimes. And it's the most demanding. And it will come against peace if you allow it to. That's when you have to stop and say, no, no, no. 
You don't understand. I know who God is. You can't argue with that. And I know what he did. I'm not letting go of that. That's where you stand. And if you keep listening to the arguments that experience bring, they'll even argue, experience will argue with reality that's right up against your nose. You remember after Jesus res was resurrected and he went, he talked to the two men on the road to Emmaus and they figured out, oh, Jesus is alive. They run to the room where the disciples are eating together. They tell them, uh, Jesus is alive. And, you know, they're thinking, yeah, yeah, where have y'all been? And what have you been smoking? They just, they just heard that. But suddenly Jesus appeared in the room. But you know what? They, they were shocked. Jesus looked at the looks on their faces. He perceived the troubling of their heart. And he said, he said to them, why are you troubled? And you know what the word troubled there is? It's that terrasso. It's why are you so deeply shaken within that I'm standing right here? I told you I was coming back. I've only been gone three days. Come on. Come on. And they were troubled. And he, it was like, what is wrong with you? But you know, before he asked them that, you know what he said when he first walked in? Peace be unto you. Yes. But you know they couldn't hear it. They were too troubled to hear it. And they, they is, you know what was arguing? Their experience. They saw him die on the cross. They saw him buried in a tomb. He couldn't be standing here in front of them. They were terrorized. This must be a ghost. Now experience will explain to you what this isn't and call it reality. That's why this is part connected to that imagination thing up front. Your experience can help you figure out what's not like it really is. Or what really is like it's not. And Jesus said, don't, uh-uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. I told you I was coming. These two men from Emmaus told you they were coming, that I was here. And it's time to lay down what you thought. And there's a time, y'all, when we need to hold to the Prince of Peace for His peace. We need to hold to who we know more than what we think we know. Remember that in days ahead. That will keep you from losing the treasure he's giving you. And you cling to him more than what you thought you know. I'll, I'll just put that in, add that into a prophetic word. You cling, cling to God's intent more than what you thought he meant in that word. Okay? Now, a second reason that we can be challenged and we need to hold to the peace God gives us is that it can leak out of us. It's, it's like, think of it as liquid gold. And it can leak out of us. Because you'll find the phrase in the Bible 33 times that says, hold your peace. And every time you see it, you know what it means? Don't say what you're thinking or feeling. Keep a tight lip. Don't lose it. And reason that it says this, that gives you a clue. One of the ways that we lose the peace God gives us is through this hole right here. It leaks out. And the mouth has become a theme this morning. It was a theme in the songs. It's a theme that uh, this, is go, this is going to be a honed weapon for the kingdom of God and quit being used against us. So be that. But if we're used to living with a troubled heart, we don't even realize when we are losing the peace God's given us. It's normal to talk about the list of woes. We have a cousin, if you just mention certain trigger phrases, we get the whole list again. I mean, we're very careful. We tiptoe around him. We keep the conversation going 90 miles an hour that way because we know. And we don't want to hear that again. It can become a habit, and your kids grow up in it. It's a family trait. Any peace that God gave is just leaked out over the week, leaked out over the days. And it can actually feel like the right thing to do. Is that bizarre? But we can start living that way. And we deplete the peace God gives us. And the problem is when, when peace leaves the building, troubling is welcome in. We need the peace of God. So losing the peace of God worsens the heart-troubled situation. So keep a tight lip and hold diligently to peace as a priority. Now let me just recap here and we'll be done. God forbid that we live continually with a troubled heart. There's no life, no future in it. 
We need to fo not follow our imagination. We need to not mouth our agreement that the enemy can use against us. And we need to use the keys God gave us of trust and peace. That's our way to handle. We're all going to have trouble, but when it starts trying to go in, it's time to do something and clean it out. And it's not, there are some here this morning, and as, as I thought of this this morning when I was praying, I thought, Lord, there's going to be people here today that have heard what I've said, but there's a feeling in you, a sense that it's too late. There's no getting past what has troubled me all my life or what has troubled me in the last three years or what is troubling me right now. It's already two streets past doing these things. But I have good news for you. It's never too late for God to get you to an overcoming place over troubling that will undermine your entire future if it stays there. That is not the will of God. There is no peace, and it's hard to think about trusting God when you get to that place. Uh, the, you know, there's times when trust has to be a decision. You can't back it up with anything else in the moment. You're just too torn up, but you choose to trust God. You know that any problems you're dealing with are not on His end. They're down here somewhere, and frankly, God, I'm tired of looking for them. I'm just going to trust you until you can show me how to do anything I need to do. But that, you know, I call what I'm telling you right now to be in the condition of you feel like none of that applies to me. You really can't lift your head above the troubling. I call that a third degree troubled heart. Because the Bible name for that kind of troubling is oppression. And oppression means somebody who's dominated by a troubled heart and there is, they are convinced there's no way out. That is, not, that is not uncommon. That doesn't make you a bad person. That tells you where you're standing. And God can reach you right there. In fact, that kind of troubling hopelessness is doubly sad because it can deteriorate into depression, into anxiety attacks, and into a place where your heart is actually torn, ripped. And once your heart is torn... It's like an opening. It, there's a separation, a breach that devils will take advantage of to come and torment you more. So, I mean, this is a, a, a down, degenerating situation. But it starts with a feeling of there's no way out of this. And there's a lot of people that can honestly, you see why they feel that way. I'm sure a lot of people who are, have been hooked on some kind of drug or, or pill or whatever feel like there's no way out. But that's not the truth. God is your way, but you have got to come to a place where you can hear it enough to hope in the Lord. But that, that de de generation down to more torment, you weren't born to live that way. And you certainly do not have to live that way. And you certainly should decide that you will not live that way. And in fact, let me give you some even good news. At that point, you know what you need if you're under oppression? You need healing. You need healing of the heart that the enemy's taken advantage of that's been wounded or whatever, been whacked by life. Because it says Jesus in Acts 10, 38, it says Jesus went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed. Don't you love it? Some, no. A few, no. He healed all those who were oppressed. And here I love this phrase on the end of that verse. For God was with him. Here's, here's the shot in the arm. God's with us, y'all. He's with you too. Even if you've been under heavy oppression, even if it has gotten into depression or anxiety, God is with you and he's bigger than those forces against you. And he will bring you to a place of complete overcoming. I haven't come to you today with a new wonder pill for dissolving troubles, but I have come with the confidence that you're here by appointment, and we are too, and we're here to think on these things, and we're here to lift our heads and our hearts to our God and see what He would do about a troubled heart and whether it is giving us instruction to follow with wisdom and peace and trust involved or whether it is healing that changes everything 
This is the day for it. I have confidence he came here today and we are here and our God is with you and it's time to be healed. It's time to be changed. This is what hit me when we were sitting here earlier. And this is what I'm going to say to you. Just breathe today. Because the Lord has released a supernatural peace in our midst. You breathe it in until you begin to feel and know and come to a confidence that he is changing what needs to be changed because he healed all that were oppressed. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you today for this time together. We thank you that you are our faithful God, that your word does not diminish, that your power does not lay down in the face of conflict, that you, Lord, are mindful of every step of our journey to this point. I thank you for we're in an intersection that you've ordained. And this I know, Lord, with my whole heart, I am confident that we will walk from this place today with a healing that has begun, with an equipping that will change the future, change the now. I know you are delivering, you are healing, you are equipping us to overcome. It's your will. And Lord, this is what I declare for us. We will bring hope and healing to others because of what has begun here today. But beyond that, the the declaration we say is, so let it be done. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Hallelujah. Can you just pray just a moment? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We know that the word was purposeful, and I believe that it spoke to you this morning. If you're like, that's me, Kathy, if you have the courage to stand and say, that's me, my heart has been troubled, and I need a healing, I need some hope this morning, would you just stand where you're at right now, all across, amen, there's one, come on, there's, I know they're all over the building, hallelujah, 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 just stand where you're at. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Kathy, I'm just going to ask you to come and just pray for the people. Hallelujah. And we're going to just join in. Lord, I thank you. There's agreement now. There is an openness for the will of God to be done in the earth just as it is in heaven. And Lord, we stand as witness. This is the time. This is the place. This is a change that cannot be denied, a change that cannot be defied because God said, you are with us and Lord, you are our healer. You are our deliverer, and we will live the life we were born to live because you are our God. Father, I release healing right now for those that the the breach, the whack to the heart came earlier than 10 years old. There are some here, Lord, that have lived with this all their lives. Today I declare the word, the word is enough. From here on, we go, we go, we go into the goodness of God. A display, our life becomes a display of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for not just relief, relief for sure, but resolve that changes how we see, how we choose, and where we go from this point on. Thank you for it, Lord. It's more than enough. You are the healer. From childhood on, You have been there, you've seen our journey, and you are with us now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So be. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just receive that today. Amen. Amen. Just make your declaration from this place this morning, just as you go out. I will not let my heart be troubled. Just say it over and over. Every time it tries to creep back in or the enemy comes, I will not let... I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not. I will not. (laughs) I will not let my heart be troubled. What an excellent word. Thank you, Kathy, so much. We're looking forward to our service tonight. Yes, if you'll bring that, Pastor Bob. 
We want to bless the man and woman of God this morning. So we want you to um, get ready your offerings right now. We're going to let you just come and, and put it here as we go. And then we'll be dismissed this morning. We know you'll be excited to be back in the house tonight. Six o'clock for our service tonight. Would you go ahead and uh, prepare your offering? Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and bring it. Thank you.